Tonight's episode of Legacy Battle is brought to you by Neora Fit. They say pictures are worth a thousand words. Let's look at some of the amazing results that Neora Fit users have enjoyed. Check out this guy. And look at what Neora has done for this woman. That's impressive. And check this out. Neora Fit goes way beyond weight management. Look at all these extra benefits. Neora also features plant-based skincare and hair restoration products. Contact my good friend Vaughn at YvonneSillNeora.com and check out all the ways Neora can improve your life. Enjoy the show. This is Legacy Battle coming at you on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, iHeartRadio, everywhere you can think of. You can sponsor this show. Contact us in the comments section. Michael Adams here, creator of Legacy Battle. With me tonight, Gridiron Zone, Brian King, Penn State Collegiate All-Star, Kevin Adams, Ball State athlete, Paul Havocott. We're joined tonight by a former NHL goaltender, played 17 years in the NHL, most notably with the Leafs, Flyers, Boo, Flyers, <laughs> and Penguins. In the 94-95 season, led the NHL in wins, finishing the top five for the Vezina Trophy. He is 77th all-time in wins in the NHL and 53rd all-time in saves. Back in the 80s, there were a lot more shots going on <laughs> in the 90s than there are today. So Stanley yeah. Cup winner, Ken Reggett. Ken, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you guys very much for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you on. You're perfect for tonight's debate. We're going to be debating the top five Pittsburgh Penguin goalies of all time. And, of course, afterwards, we'll have a Q&A with Ken about his career. So let's start out tonight with Tommy Barrasso. Tom Barrasso played 18 seasons, started with Buffalo, played for Pittsburgh, Ottawa, Carolina, Toronto, and St. Louis. Uh, he was drafted fifth overall by Buffalo in the 83 draft. But uh, in November of 88, uh, the Sabres traded Barrasso with a third-round draft pick in the uh, 1990 draft to the Pens for uh, Doug Bodger and Darren Shannon. Uh, Barrasso uh, is a two-time Stanley Cup uh, winning champion with the Penguins. Uh, he won championships in 91-92. Um, he was established as, I guess you can coin him as like a money goalie. Um, you know, he was coined that during his play uh, in those cup runs. Uh, he came up huge, was clutch. Um, he missed uh, almost two full seasons in 94, 95, uh, and 96, 97 due to injuries. But he came back and actually was had good performances uh, the next couple of years um, after coming back. Uh, in 97, he became the first American goaltender to record 300 NHL wins. Um, he was traded to Ottawa in 2000 from Pittsburgh, uh, but he ended up, uh, he also won an Olympic silver medal in 2002. Um, but he holds uh, records. Uh, for the most assists by goaltender at 48 and points by goaltender uh, with 48 in the NHL. Uh, he has the most consecutive NHL playoff wins at 14. And that was between seasons 92 and 93 with the Penguins. I uh, shared the record for the most playoff wins in one playoff season at 11. Uh, that was in 92 with the Penguins. He shares the record for the most wins in one playoff season at 16 in 92 uh, with the Penguins again. Uh, he has the second most wins by a U.S. born goaltender at 369 wins, which is also 17th all time uh, on the wins list. He is ninth all time in saves. He has over 22,000 saves in the regular season. He's 13th all time in playoff wins with 61. Uh, his time with the Penguins, he made an all star game in 93, two Stanley Cups in 91 92. He had six 20 plus win seasons, two 30 plus win seasons, and he had one season over 43 wins or I mean over 40 wins, he, he had finished with 43. He won 226 games with the Penguins. Um, for the history of Penguins goalies, uh, he holds the career most points, most penalty minutes, <laughs> season most wins, season lowest goals allowed average, season most points, career playoff most points, 
career playoffs, most penalty minutes. He does have an attitude, as you can see. <laughs> he has season playoff most wins tied with Flurry. Season playoffs most shutoffs tied with Flurry, Murray, Tugnot, uh, and Hedberg. And he has the season playoffs most points for Penguins goaltender history. He was inducted into the United States Hockey Hall of Fame in 2009. Key piece to the 91-92 Stanley Cup runs. And I kind of feel he got a bad rap with the media or else his, his jersey would probably be hanging in the rafters in Pittsburgh as well. But he definitely deserves to be in the top five goaltenders for Pittsburgh all time. There, there's two gimmies tonight. Him and, and one we're going to talk about later that uh, probably are just guaranteed to make this top five. His Raptors will be in the jer – his jersey will be in the Raptors one day. That's a given. But, um, Ken, uh, let me ask you your opinion on this. I always felt Barrasso might have been a little weak over the shoulders on those high shots. I mean, you saw him play quite a bit. And also, Kevin mentioned he had some problems with the press. I always felt his numbers should put him in the Hall of Fame. What are your thoughts on those? No, that's exactly right. Uh, the guy came out and uh, and he had two two uh, Stanley Cup victories, ninety one, ninety two. He he led the team, helped lead the team with Mario at the helm, and and the and the talent they had was like an all star game. And you know, I was fortunate enough to come in ninety two and, and and witness that, and is very honored too. And and Tom Brasso coming out uh, from his draft. Drafted out, drafted out to Buffalo, and that and that was, I believe, that was ninety eighty three. Yeah, well, something 80, like that. Eighty three. I got drafted by Toronto in eighty two, so I kind of had a, a keen eye on him all along, and he was, uh, I believe, a first round draft pick as well, which is remarkable, especially for back in those uh, days, getting drafted that high, and then to go on and and, uh, and have statistics listed like uh, like his are, are listed, whether it's in the league or. or uh, for the Penguins, <laughs> but he, yeah, he's he's a he's a All Star, Hall of Fame goaltender, American, and uh, probably U.S. or Canada and, uh, overall as well. Um, you know, and perhaps, but he did get a bit of a bad rap for whatever reason uh, that may be. But uh, you know, he's 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 a great goaltender. It was an honor for me to play with him, and uh, and uh, I, I learned a lot from him and, and the team at that time when I was with uh, all those guys playing together. Brian, Barrasso has made so many big plays for the Penguins, won so many games for the Penguins, but is he possibly remembered for the most disappointing goal in Penguins history? Overtime, Game 7, Islanders? No, I wouldn't put that on his shoulders at all. <laughs> that, that was a rough one. I mean, that was a breakaway. That was a, that was a, a breakdown. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, it does come to mind for sure when you think about Penguins history because they were going for that third straight cup that year. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but I don't, I don't know if you can, like you said, Ken, I don't know if you can really put that on him because you know when you're out alone on an island, it's it's really tough to to, yeah. to overcome that. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think was it was it uh, did it seem stoppable at that time? It did, but during the circumstances with the flow of the game and everything was going, it. Uh, you know, it was an unfortunate goal, but by no means can you put the weight of that world on one person's shoulder. You know, we, we did a lot to get to where they did, where we did that year. And uh, for some reason, the Islanders, they just, uh, that first round was like, uh, sounds like uh, kind of a curse at times. They've done that to a few teams, and that was that happened to be us that year. As someone who's played some goaltender, I'm used to having the blame on me, so I'm throwing it on Tommy. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let's move on to our second goalie. It's going to be this guy right here, Matt Murray. <laughs> so I, I got I got Murray tonight. As Kevin always says, props gets the win. So here, here's the thing you need to know about Matt Murray. He's the only rookie to win the Stanley Cup twice. So as a rookie, won the Stanley Cup twice. If that doesn't make you top five for the Penguins, I don't know what does. But third round pick. By the Penguins in 2012, um, he set the AHL longest shutout streak with the Baby Pens at 304 minutes and 11 seconds. So Those AHL oh. history comes in, yeah. does that. That's a long time. And he also broke the AHL rookie shutout record. So just a phenomenal rookie year with the Baby yeah. Pens comes up. Um, like I said, he he wins the Cup twice. Considered a rookie for both of them. Now, with the Pens, he is third all-time in wins. And he didn't play with the Penguins that long, so that, that that's pretty good. Um, 914 save percentage, 
that's the highest of any goalie that we're discussing tonight. Um, so that puts him up there. He's fourth all time in shutouts on the Penguins with 11. And his 2.67 goals against average is actually the second best of anyone we're, we're discussing tonight. Um, now, he does benefit some of the older goalies we're talking about played in a much different NHL. So his stats obviously are going to look better than some of those guys. But um, he, he's a great player. You know, he, he was called up in 2015, played 10 games in the regular season. And then from game three of the playoffs on in the Rangers series, he took over. He was in goal the rest of the way. I know Flurry came in for like one game against the Lightning, but game seven, Murray was right back in there, gets the win. Um, you know, the next season, he leads him to that Stanley Cup again. And in that 2017 Stanley Cup run, he had the best save percentage of any goalie in the playoffs at .937, and he also led the playoffs in shutouts. And he got that shutout in game seven against the Nash, I'm sorry, game six against the Nashville Predators. So phenomenal goalie, obviously still in the league. They just moved on, he moved him on to uh, Ottawa. He wanted more money than what the Pens were going to be able to afford this year. So they, they moved him on and went with Jari. But I believe he belongs in the top 10. So Ken, with, with Murray, I mean, he's uh, had some consistency problems. A lot, a lot of a lot of people think his glove hand is weak, and that was exposed in the 2018 playoffs by the Capitals. So what are, what are your thoughts on Matt Murray? Boy, Matt, Matt, Matt Murray coming up, coming from where he came from and with the stats and with the record he had in the minors and, and uh, how well he did there and then stepping in for the first two uh, two years of his career and winning Stanley Cups. Uh, such as they did with uh, Flurry being right there and going down and, and him stepping in and, and taking the team all the way through. It does not, it, it doesn't get any better than that by far. I mean, if he can make a career of that, that's, that's, that's amazing, but uh, not many people would like a two-year career. You know, you want to stretch that out as long as you can. But uh, yeah, he, he's put together some good numbers. Uh, I, I think because he came out and played, Circumstances dictated what exactly what happened, and that winning the two cups the way they did is very impactful for the city, for the team, for everybody. Uh, and he was a big part of that. And, and Flurry got got the crew there, and that was a big thing. So, how that you put that package together to stand alone? Can he bring the team to the to the dance and and uh, with the Stanley Cup? Uh, Maybe he was a guy that did need a guy like Flurry uh, at times, and uh, Flurry, I think, I think he gave Flurry a lot of confidence and, and was able to let Flurry bloom and develop himself into the goalie he is. And I think there was a good chemistry between two of them. Um, but again, those are two, those are two great one-two punches right across the board. And Matt Murray with all those accolades, yeah, I mean that's that definitely uh, a guy for a serious debate in a topic like this tonight. Kevin, I know yeah. you're, you're a flurry lover. So what were your thoughts in 2017 playoffs, third round? Flurry gets pulled and they put Matt Murray in. Yeah, actually I was a little upset by it because um, that was against Ottawa, right, if I'm not mistaken. I think uh, Flurry had actually flourished um, in the series before. You know, Flurry actually played a big part in getting us into that, that round. Um, you know, Murray, he, he's a good, he's a good goalie. I'm not going to take away from him. Um, but I mean, he, he goes to Ottawa and I know he's, he's very injury prone as he got injured again in Ottawa this season. But, um, I, I think he just never was really given a chance. I think the fans in Pittsburgh were just so hung up on Flurry. Um, and we're kind of upset that Flurry kind of got moved to the side for Murray. Um, and then got let go at the expansion draft, which I don't blame the Penguins. Murray's younger, he was cheaper. And he just came off of winning two Stanley Cups, um, but I, I do th I do feel Flurry was a big part of us winning those cups because he definitely helped out in the playoffs uh, when when Murray was out. Okay. Let's move on to Les Binkley. All right, Les Binkley. So we're going to go back to the beginning of the the Penguins um, franchise. Uh, Les Binkley actually spent a lot, a lot of time in the WHL, and then he actually began his NHL career at 33 years old uh, when he when he signed with the expansion Penguins. So he was the first starting goaltender in their history. Uh, he spent five seasons with the Pens, 
won 58 games. He had an 858 save percentage, uh, 312 goals against average, and 11 shutouts. Um, in 69-70, he helped the Penguins to their first playoff berth and their first playoff series victory, which was a 4-0 sweep over the Oakland Seals. Uh, keep in mind that this was long before the days of Mario Lemieux or any of the superstars for the Penguins. Uh, this team was not very good. It was not filled with all-stars or anything like that. Um, but Binkley, he was the man with this team, and he was the reason why they got the wins that they got. Uh, in his first season, 20 of the 27 Penguins wins and 10 of the 13 ties that they got were all games that Les Binkley started. Um, League-wide, he started the third most games. He had the third most ties, the third fewest goals allowed, the third most saves, and the second most shutouts with six shutouts. Um, and he does have his name on the Stanley Cup as a Penguin because um, he went uh, to he joined the Penguins in 1990-91 as a scout, and um, and he was able to win. You know, he was able to help the uh, the Penguins cause to win a couple Stanley Cups in that role. So uh, Les Finkley, he was there at the beginning uh, and sort of provide that foundation for the Penguins franchise. Ken, what, what do you think it means to a goalie to be like the first ever player for that franchise? I mean, that seems like it's something special. Well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, especially back then, I think, what, what year was that exactly? 67? 67 was the first season, yeah. 67, okay, good. And uh, – and, and back then, it was, you're not that far off the original six, and the league is just starting to grow and blossom. And, you know, you got Pittsburgh coming in the league, and, and here's a fellow coming in as a goaltender. Goaltenders are always uh, a little bit on the special side because it, they're, they're not one of, uh, you know, 18 skaters, whether you're forward or fast, or you're one of two guys. And that's nowadays. Back in those days, the backup goalie was, was I think, the trainer, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'm too far from being wrong on that one either. Um, but uh, you know, he, he jumped in, and, and that was he was like, I believe the first the first uh, penguin penguin player to be signed for the Penguins and to come out and uh, have that opportunity. And look at his stats; they're actually really good for an expansion team coming out of the gate and and uh, and and setting a tone for the Pittsburgh Penguins for the to where we are today. I mean, that's that's unique in itself to have that opportunity and. And you got a quality goaltender too there in Les Binkley. So, and again, the guys like those guys are, are guys that help build the build the uh, the hockey chemistry in in Pittsburgh or, or, or hockey roots, I guess. And and, it, and it goes back even further with the Hornets and the fan clubs and stuff like that, and the Toronto Maple Leafs and King Clancy and stuff like that. And to have Les Binkley, a guy that's part of that era in itself, really, really puts hockey heritage in Pittsburgh's corner. It's nice to see. Paul, we are talking about two older goalies tonight in in this group between Les Binkley and Dennis Heron, who we'll discuss a little bit later. Should we be looking at their stats a little bit differently because of the time period they played in the NHL? Well, you can. I, I think you can argue both ways, really. I mean, it's it's uh, hockey has that stigma where you can sometimes see stars that age really well. So, you know, we were just talking about Yager in one of the other shows and how he's older and still playing. So, I mean, I don't know if you can look at it different in the sense of, you know, like these guys are playing with young and old, it seems like. So I think it, it's a sport where you can, you can compare apples to apples because there's a, there's a mixed age out there on the ice. I mean, there's one thing I will say I'll throw out real quick is there's been a major upgrade in the equipment that, that the um, that the goaltenders have. I mean, you look at the guys, what they were wearing, um, you know, some of them weren't even wearing masks back in the 60s. And so um, between that and then, you know, the evolution of butterfly style, all these things, the, the goals against and the save percentages numbers have been, you know, are, are, are a lot different than they were back then. So you do kind of, I think you have to take the, the arrow uh, with a grain of salt there when you look at these numbers. Everything changed when Bobby Hall curved the stick. So Yeah. yeah. yeah if I can jump in if I can jump in briefly and, and that's exactly right too with the Bobby Hall and the, and the stick curves and the and the, the puck going faster and lifting off the ice. And if you, there's actually a really good book out there. It's like the hundred years of hockey and it goes back into some of the rules earlier back when the Ottawa uh, 
Toronto, Mar Toronto Mar Mar Marlboros or something like that in the Ottawa 67s. Um, in hockey heritage, and the rule the rules for goaltenders at that point, they weren't allowed to go down. They had to stand up. That was, and and so how the game has evolved. And if you look at, I mean, if you go when I started 30 years ago to where they are today, that's that's almost uh, 10, 20 percentage points of a, a goals against average difference because of the way the game has changed in itself. When you got Gary Bettman and some of those guys changing the rules, the stats in itself will change with it, as you can see with the forwards and the goaltenders, is the same thing. Okay. Let's move on to Jayos Aben. Okay. Not going to spend a ton of time on JS, but basically 5'11", 180 pounds, drafted by Pittsburgh, 76 overall uh, in the third round in 1995. He played with Pittsburgh, Toronto, and L.A. Uh, JS got 218 games under his belt. For 11,000, just over 11,197 minutes. He had a 2.96 goals against average, a 900 save average, and he was really almost even at 80 wins and 83 losses. And he did have seven shutouts. I think my other goalie is going to be the number one, not to be cocky. So I'll just give you a brief update as to what JS is doing. He's now reviewing videos for people who want to get uh, hockey critiques. So for 75 bucks, he'll review up to three minutes of your goalie video, and then he'll give you an in-depth evaluation while he critiques your skills with a video marker, suggesting drills you may want to utilize for your game and improvements. Or you can work with him for $200. You can do an online session. So, Kevin, if you want to have JS work with you, just send him some videos of yourself. Uh, just don't send him the videos you've been sending me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Hey, so Ken uh, is basically Aban and Skuja who came in when they came in. They 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 moved you on, traded you out. Um, I mean, did you get to work with Aban at all, like before they brought him up, or? No, I I, I didn't. Uh, I think the the, the first time uh, JS and I were in, were introduced, if it wasn't in a training camp, it was in the playoffs. And I don't remember exactly what year, but it was that year when we went a few overtimes against uh, Washington Capitals and Mario uh, left the game after the first period. Whatever year that was, I think four or five or something like that. But, yeah, he, he was definitely a goal, goaltender that came in uh, and, and a very solid goaltender. He had good credentials uh, coming up uh, through. Um, he did well. I, don't, I think the team at that point uh, was in a little bit of a transition um, goaltender wise, uh, I, I had left and Tommy, it, you know, Tommy was around and, and I think they were kind of, you know, more or less find themselves. It was after that, uh, you know, that one, two run in uh, three, four and, and the team started kind of like trying to find itself a little bit. And that's when JS showed up and, you know, he, he did a great job when he was here. He had good, good stats. Uh, but again, it was, it was a matter of maybe the, not the best of times for him at that point. Okay. Let, let's move on to the Moose. Yeah, the Moose is actually another teammate of Ken Reggett's over there. I uh, played with him in Manitoba. Um, so, <laughs> Johan Hedberg played for the Pens, Canucks, uh, Stars, Thrashers, Devils. Played for quite a few teams in the NHL. Uh, but he made his NHL debut in 2000. Um, he won gold in the 98 World Championships for Sweden. Uh, so, he played on the Swedish national team, so he's got that under his belt, played on their Olympic team, too. He was drafted 218th overall by the Flyers in 94, um, but in 2001, he was traded to Pittsburgh. Uh, he reported directly to the Pens uh, when he got traded. Uh, he got traded from San Jose um, Farm System, um, and they kind of brought him in to stabilize the Penguins' goaltending situation. Um, it was not going too well at that point. Um, uh, he was, you know, Craig Patrick wanted to make a move that kind of shook things up because 2000 was an interesting season. So his play in Manitoba actually caught the eye of Craig Patrick, who brought him in. Um, and when he came in, he still had his Manitoba moose helmet, which had a giant moose painted across it. Um, and that's actually kind of where the name came from because every time he made like a spectacular save, people would scream moose and became an immediate fan favorite. Um, I even got his bobblehead here. 
So I got my prop too there, I Mike. That, I got that one too. <laughs> <laughs> but no, in that first season when he came up, he went 7-1-1 one, and one in nine games that he played uh, before the playoffs. Um, and he outperformed Kolzik and Hasek uh, in the playoffs to send the Pens to the conference finals that year. Um, in 2002, he set career highs with 25 wins. Um, he played 66 games uh, that season with the Penguins, um, which is a club record for a season. Um, he was picked uh, for the Swedish Olympic team, like I had mentioned. Uh, he played a total of three seasons with Pittsburgh. Uh, he got 46 wins, so he wasn't there a long time. But I think he had the biggest underdog story. You know, he came in during a season where it was Yvonne Hillinka's first season with the Pens. The gears had started, you know, to get Yager's exit out of Pittsburgh. They were off to a mediocre start. Lemieux had came out of retirement mid-December that year. Um, the defense never really had a solid person, like a number one person. Um, and the goaltenders were all banned, Snow and Perron. Um, so it wasn't really solid goaltending in there. Um, so Hedberg was traded for. He had never played an NHL game prior to coming to Pittsburgh. Um, he was deep in the Sharks farm system. He was behind Nabokov, Shields, Kiprasov, Toscala. Like, he was never going to play an NHL game. <laughs> for San Jose with those guys in front of him. Uh, but nobody expected him to be an impact player. You know, he turned heads the way he did. Threw, they threw him in head first. He stopped 41 shots in that first game of 44 shots and a 6-3 to win over Florida. That's a lot of shots. Uh, he went, like I said, 7-1-1 in those nine games before the playoffs. There was concerns of how he would handle the pressure, but it didn't phase him. And like I said, he was a fan favorite right away. Okay. Ken, Kevin mentioned you you played with Johan Hedberg up in Manitoba. So so tell us tell us about the Moose. I, I did I did play with him. Yeah, he's uh, he, he remind me of uh, uh, Yager. He's a big kid. He just just loved to have fun. He always had a smile on his face, and uh, he always brought brought a lot of good things wherever he went. And uh, everybody loved him. But yeah, I played with him down uh, down in Winnipeg when I got sent down from. I was playing with Detroit, and I got sent to the minors. And Winnipeg had a, a spot open. And it was a Manitoba Moose, and they were just getting ready to do some promoting for a new rink for to get the Winnipeg Jets in there, type of that. So it was kind of kind of interesting here all the way across the board. Randy Carlisle, former Penguin, he was a coach. Um, Scarlett O'Neill you know, was a defensive coach. Uh, they had Johan got sent in there from uh, San Jose, and like you guys said, he had a really strong lineup up against up ahead of him. And he wasn't going to get a sniff, and he knew that. And he was kind of like on the last little bit. And, and I went down, and uh, we, they had us rooming together right over the gate the whole nine yards. And, and a nice guy. And, and uh, he's they give me all the respect in the world. And here, I, you know, I played 16 years at the time. And, and uh, we'd be on the ice cracks, and he'd be down at the other end of the ice, and he'd be on his toes looking, watching the play set up and watch see what I was doing. And I was watching him watch me. He never, he loved to learn. And I, and I learned about him that he had all it took. It was just he needed that little little bit of help just to give him a little bit of confidence. And so rooming together and playing together, we had, we had a bet, too, by the end of the year that uh, we'd outperform each other. And I think he ended up uh, – I never did pay the bet up either. <laughs> but uh, but he, he came along really strong, and he got, he got traded uh, from San Jose to Pittsburgh, and they were calling him up right away. And uh, he called me up and he apologized to me for, for going up because he thought I'd get pulled up to to, uh, to Pittsburgh. And I said, I said, yo, yo, I said, that, I said, my time is is, is not now, it's, it's your time now. And, uh, you know, don't, I said, up here, I'll help you. He said, you're doing good, you're playing great. He was probably having a great year. Uh, one of his best years, I should say, and he got pulled in and he had the year that you guys were saying with the seven and one record going into the playoffs and doing a great job. And, and here's a guy with a little bit of confidence and, and, uh, and believing in yourself, what it can do. And uh, he, he continued that right through with the years here with the Penguins and, and so much so that he did finally get a, a coaching job with the San Jose uh, Sharks as well. So great goalie, great, great person, great human, and uh, definitely an asset to the team in those years. As Kevin said, he, he was thrown right into the fire. So that first game with the Florida against the Florida Panthers, Brian, that, he, Pavel Bure comes down not once but twice on a breakaway in the first period. He stuffs him on both. I mean, did that just right there make him a, a favorite among the fans? Oh, I mean, it was just one thing after another. And, and I I don't know if there was another Penguin goaltender that had like that 
short little 10 game window or something where they were playing with so much confidence. I mean, he was just like, he was just in the zone. And then hearing what Ken says about him, like not being a real serious guy, kind of being like a funny guy. It's like, you know, it just kind of amazes me that he was able to kind of turn that on, you know, and, and get real serious in the net like that. That's really, that's really cool. All right, let's move on to the flower. Marc-Andre Fleury, my favorite Penguins goalie, but uh, Flowers born 11-28-84, first round pick by the Penguins in 2003, and I think right away they seemed to kind of know he was going to be legendary. You know, initially when he got drafted, I think he lived with Mario Lemieux temporarily until he found more of a permanent solution, and uh, he's got some international experience here. He represented Canada twice in the Junior Hockey League, winning back-to-back -back silver medals at the World Junior Championships in 2003-2004. He got a gold medal with Team Canada in the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver. And he's a special guy. He had not posted a losing record since the 2005-2006 NHL season, which I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any other active goaltender in the league has been able to accomplish that. Some of his stats, and I'm coming right after Barrasso here. Sorry, Kevin. He's got 883 games. 492 wins, closing out on 500. He's still active in the league, obviously. It's kind of a sore spot for Penguins fans, for me too. I think Barrasso had about 369 wins, if I'm not mistaken. He had 276 losses, 82 ties, plus overtime losses. And he had 67 shutouts. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah, that's, those are high numbers. I think Barrasso was in the 30s. He had over, he's over 51,000 minutes and counting. And he has a 2.55 goals against average, 913 save percentage. And as we mentioned earlier, this is a goalie that is tied to three Stanley Cup rings. And he actually added to his legacy by appearing in the Stanley Cup uh, with Vegas. And as we all know, with the emergence of Matt Murray, uh, Mark kind of became exposed in the expansion draft and the Penn's lost in the Vegas Golden Knights, where he still plays, still performs well, still in the playoffs as we speak. So that's Mark andre Fleury. So, Ken, uh, the Pittsburgh fans, you know, they act, they love Flower now, but there were some years there where they were really on his case for some early exits from the playoffs. I mean, we yeah. said earlier you can't put that all on a goalie, but uh, – how do you think Flower did overcoming stuff like that? I, I, I think obviously, if you look where he where he's positioning himself right now, I he did a pretty good job doing getting over that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Plays a really good style of butterfly goalie too. Uh, I, man, how he stretches like that, I, I have no idea. Yeah, no, no, he he uh, his style is unique in itself. He's such a strong goaltender. Um, one thing I do remember when he first came, uh, his first year, rookie year, and at the old, you know, we were above the uh, Zamboni end of the rink, and I was sitting in like the first or second row, watching him move sideways. Was I'd never seen anything like that. It was. It was phenomenal because he, he could move sideways down on his knees better than anybody ever saw at that point. Uh, so he, he was definitely uh, a goalie with, with a unique style in itself, and he was strong at what he did. And I, I think he had to learn a bit. And, and you're right, he did he did take a lot of heat for the you know beginning of his career and and uh, perhaps not, not being the strongest that he could have been. And he obviously changed and came along. I don't know if Melange, Jim Melange was working with him at that point, but – it was like he, he he did some extra work with his with his game to to get himself better, and he wasn't doing that. Murray had come along along the way too into that towards the end, and uh, I, I think the two of them complemented each other. And when I talk, spoke about uh, Matt Murray earlier, I, I I touched on that how the two of them I think helped each other out and helped each other uh, lift each other, and uh, I think that was it was like two people that were playing well together in unison they get torn apart almost when it went to that expansion draft and and, uh, and and Pittsburgh you know not protecting Flurry but protecting Murray you understand with the money and the, and the maybe buying a few years and stuff but in, in hindsight in the long run you know it's it it's didn't turn out to be that way and then but I think the whole thing with uh, Flurry heading off to Vegas. If you look at Vegas' expansion team, they were pretty much set up to win the Stanley Cup out of the gate. 
And that's my conspiracy theories. I think something, that's why they, they have uh, Flurry right now. It's for the good of the game of hockey, like Gretzky going from Peter Pockington and Edmonton to Los Angeles. That's Mike. That's my. That's my. <laughs> you like Kevin, that? <laughs> Kevin, we don't normally rank these guys. We just put five on the list. But is it Flurry and everyone else? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I even, I was talking to one of my buddies a little bit, a little bit before this podcast and, uh, he had mentioned that Barrasso was easy, uh, to be in top five. And I said to him that I would put Flurry over Barrasso. Um, Flurry was the face of the franchise for a while with Sid, um, huge part of the Stanley cup victory in 09 made that final save. I think it was against Lindstrom at the final seconds, uh, to save the game and, and win it, uh, in 09. And then, uh, 16, 17, I had already mentioned, you know, he beat Columbus. He beat the Capitals. He, he, I feel was the main reason why we beat the Capitals that year. His goaltending in that series was remarkable. Um, and he started off, um, against Ottawa and, and then they pulled him. Uh, that's, that's kind of, I felt that was shady. Um, but I do feel like Flurry's the number one goalie in Pittsburgh history. Um, and it's kind of funny, the, uh, his very first NHL game I was actually at, uh, at the Civic Arena. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And man, Ziggy Palfi got the penalty shot. Um, crowd was going crazy, uh, when, when he stuffed him. Uh, Ziggy Palfi was a great player. And when he stuffed Palfi on that penalty shot, that place like nearly exploded. I mean, they ended up losing the game, but man, you could just tell from game one of his career that this was a special goaltender, and he was going to turn heads, and he's going to make the Hall of Fame easily. His his play was just unbelievable in that game, uh, and those gr- bright yellow pads you couldn't you couldn't miss them. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Dennis Huron. So, third round pick, fortieth overall in nineteen seventy two. So if it was the third round and 40th overall, that should tell you how few teams there were in the NHL at that point. But uh, interesting fact, he is the first goaltender in the NHL history to make a team's roster right out of training camp after he was drafted. So that, that's an interesting tidbit about him, and that's not something that happens very often. So, But uh, the 76-77 season, he put up a 2.94 goals against average, led the Pens to the postseason. You know, we weren't making a lot of postseasons in the early days of the Penguins. Um, so that was pretty big for that time period. He's fifth in wins in Penn's history. And I only got to prove that he's top five. So he's fifth in wins in Penn's history. His six shutouts ties him with the one and only Ken Reggett. And he had 11, season with the, 11 seasons with the Pens. So his goals against average, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. It's not great. <laughs> It's not great at all, but, you know, as we stated earlier, he played in the late 70s, early 80s, wide open NHL, a lot more goal scoring going on then. He was good enough, though, to be named to Team Canada in the World Championships, picking up a bronze medal. So he might not have had, like, a a great save percentage or goals against average, but Team Canada recognized the team that he was playing on. So you can't judge him based off his stats. Uh, they may not, they may look bad, but the teams that he was playing on were usually worse. So that's kind of how I'll throw that out there about him. So, Ken, uh, let me ask you that making the team rookie year out of training camp, that, that's almost unheard of for a goaltender. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, that, that absolutely is. Uh, especially back then, there was like a, there's like unwritten rules almost. And, and one was that a uh, goaltender needs some seasoning. And so you didn't see any goaltenders drafted early. They're like third, fourth round. That was considered like a first rounder back, you know, nowadays. And, and, uh, and the goalies, they felt they were better, they, they were better suited towards the team by the time they were 25 years old, 26. And, but the, I think all the ages were a little bit older at that point too. Um, and and uh, Denny did hit a lot of, uh, he's a great guy too. We bump into him in the alumni functions all the time. But uh, you know, he, he's been, he's been and bumped into some great places like the, the Canada Cup and, and uh, he's got some hardware to go along with his, uh, with his resume through the years. And he like on you know, the all-star games and he's always, been there through junior and stuff to do well. Um, and again, 11 years in the league is pretty darn good too, especially back then. 
Um, and you're right, it is more, it was more river hockey and wide open. And, uh, you know, that was back in the days when the guys would lose a row of teeth and they'd go back in the dressing room, come back out in the bench and keep playing. So he, he had a great year, a great career and a lot of years there. And he, he, uh, he's got some uh, good stats to show for it. Uh, you know, does it rank in the top five? You know, some people could argue it does. Absolutely. He shared a bit of an, uh, Anna Jennings trophy with uh, the Montreal Canadiens, so that, yeah. that's pretty impressive. All right, let's move on to our final goalie tonight. That's going to be Ken Reggett. Uh -oh. All right, yeah, some guy named Ken Reggett. So, uh, so Ken Reggett, he won the starting job in Toronto, um, and he was with that team for five and a half seasons before being dealt to Philly in exchange for two first-round draft picks in the 1989 draft. And he spent a few seasons with Philly, shared a uh, goaltending duties with, uh, with one Ron Hextall. Uh, Penguins fans know all about that guy. Um, then he joined the Pens in 1991 in the Mark Recchi trade. So Reggett, he goes five and three that season, uh, helped the Pens to their second Stanley Cup in a row there. Uh, but his finest season was 94 95. He led the NHL in wins that year. He had a 903 save percentage, uh, 3.21 goals against. Um, and an uh, important moment, he shut out the Capitals to close out the first round series in the playoffs. Uh, so that was big. 1995-96, um, he had another fine season, going 20 and 13 in the regular season. Uh, in the playoffs, he was seven and two, including a wild four overtime win against the Capitals. Uh, over a seven years, uh, seven year Penguins career, he was 104, 64, and 21. With an 898 save percentage, uh, 3.29 goals against average. He also had six shutouts. In Penguins history, he's ranked fourth in games played, third in wins, and fifth in shutouts. So uh, uh, one heck of a, a goaltender, very important um, for the Penguins' success there in the 90s. So, Ken, I'm not sure what to ask you about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Especially since we're going to have a Q&A after this vote here in a few minutes. But uh, – uh, uh, what, let's just go. Let's go. A nice uh, softball question here. What did it mean to you to be part of the Penguins organization and, and the, the list of goaltenders that you're a part of? Yeah, no. It's. I mean, it's an honor in itself. Uh, it, it was. It's an honor coming here, being able to play with, like I said, the the guys I did have a chance to play with. I think. Uh, I think Pittsburgh has done a great job in developing from the time Wes Bakley was the first player signer to. To where we are today, the hockey history, it really follows a good tradition. I think if you go back in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, uh, some of those original six teams, that they, they would uh, be very proud of the Pittsburgh Penguins for the, the, the organization and the community itself for what they've done and brought to the game of hockey. It's been, it's been great and wonderful. Paul, let me ask you, when, when the trade happened to bring over Ken Reggett, Rick Tockett, Shell Samuelson, was it weird for you seeing three guys from the Flyers coming and putting on Penguins uniforms? Yeah, I mean, oh. coming over from the enemy, and then it's, I mean, some people would say that's what it's like seeing Brady and Gronk come over to the Bucks down here in Tampa, but, I mean, you can't even really compare it because they weren't coming from, like, a rivalry. That's It's hard to, like, be used to, like, loathing somebody and then accept them into your team and then root for them. <laughs> but it's one of those situations maybe we are like, hey – you know, at least we got them on our team now, so they're not playing against us. Fair enough. All right, let's move into our vote tonight. <laughs> Brian, you are in my top corner, so let's get this top five Penguins goalies going here. All right, well – um, And yeah, you can't I, pick your own as usual. Sorry. Just throw right pick out. your own, right. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to go with Tommy Brasso. I mean, probably the best American goalie, um, the first probably – big star goalie in, in the Penguins history as far as league wide. So we'll go with Tommy Brasso. Okay. Paul? I'd be stupid not to pick our boy Ken Reggett. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain why later on when I get to my question, but Ken's, okay. Ken's it, man. He's part of that crazy game against the Capitals. Oh, my God. He probably yeah. still wakes up thinking about Joe every once in a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take Flurry. Make it. I, I don't even need an argument for that. <laughs> I'm taking Flurry. Kevin. 
Um, I don't know. I always say that people uh, remember the championships, and Murray did win two cups as a rookie, uh, I might add. So uh, I hate it when he replaced Flurry, but I'm going to have to go with Murray. Okay. So, Ken, the pressure's on you. That leaves you Dennis Haran, J.S. Aubin, Les Binkley. And and, uh, and, and Johan Hedberg. Hedberg. Yeah. Me? You want me my pick? Yeah, you get what's left. All right. All right. I, I, I take Les Binkley. I think he's like Neil Armstrong landing on the moon in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you, you don't pick your, your teammate with the moose. That, that, that's good for you. <laughs> All right, so that makes our Penguins top five goalies, Tom Barrasso, Ken Reggett, Mark andre Fleury, uh, Matt Murray, and Les Binkley. Good job, guys. Let's move on to our Q&A for Ken. Brian, you're in the corner. Start it out. Okay, so I'm going to take you back to your first NHL game. Um, oh, so you have this you have this amazing forty eight save game against the Whaler. So what can you tell us about that? Uh, that that was that was my first NHL game, and I was is and I'm one of these guys that gets nervous. I mean, I got nervous for exhibition games, and in my mind, that told me I was ready to ready to play. That team we're in we're in the uh, we're in Hartford, and uh, Bill Billy Lego and John Anderson and Rick Vibe was the top line for the pit or for the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs that time. Billy Lego and John Anderson were two clowns like uh, Colin and Recky type of thing, and Scott Stevens. That's how they were. And before the game, like I'm nervous, I'm kind of you don't even know where to stand or what to do. So I'm, I just had to be standing there, and, and Billy Lego and that uh, John Anderson were kidding around talking. Billy goes, stop sissy kid and we'll win. <laughs> and I think the game was eight six or something like that. And there was like uh yeah, like in the sixties or fifties shots or something. And I, I didn't think as long as I played other than overtime game, I don't think I had as many shots as I did my first game. Paul. Okay, Ken. Put me there please in ninety six. And this, this question is going to get even better now that you admitted that you get nervous sometimes because this would be terrifying to me. 96, you faced your first penalty shot ever awarded during an overtime period in NHL, NHL playoff history. Did you, do you even remember it? Did you put yourself in autopilot? Did you think you had a beat on Joe? What happened? Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, a play in Washington. The play was coming down towards us. The puck. I got a piece of it, and it's kind of squeaked through. Chris Tamer, the defenseman, went, went around behind me and kind of knocked it over the stick. At the same time, it, he took the net off the off the mooring. It was accidental, but the fact that it did happen, and it was overtime, and it you know it was the first overtime uh, penalty shot. And again, I'm nervous, like you said. And uh, you know, you see Joey Juno and the referees up at center. I see soccer to them. They're going back and you know giving instructions to the benches. And and I always made a little figure eight right in front of the crease. I'd go from post to post, and and I was I was just kind of pulling snow away, you know, to make it so I can I can move. I wouldn't get slowed down if I had to move laterally. And uh, as I was doing that, I just noticed there's an excessive amount of snow that more than usual. But it was like, a, was it the third overtime? I can't second, remember. Third, second, second overtime. So, uh, so I, I left the I left the snow out front there. I didn't. I I, I just kind of cleaned out in the crease where I was moving. And I thought, as a goaltender, and this is called JSO Bay, he'd probably tell you the same thing. But if you come out and you play the shooter as he's coming in, the higher you come out, uh, the greater the chance is he's going to come around, go around behind you. Like he's got the puck in front good chance he's going to be. And if I play back, then the guy's coming down and he's going to look and he's going to see a lot of net around me and he's going to probably think, shoot. So I thought with how, how snowy it was out front, I thought, I'm going to come out a little further than usual and uh, make him go around me in the snow and see if something happens to me, maybe my best option. So that was my game plan. And usually as a goaltender, you let them make the first move, the forward and sure enough, if you watch that tape, the guy, Joey Juno, comes over the blue line and just about 10 feet inside of that, maybe not even the puck, jumps up about six inches off his stick because the ice is so snowy and bad. And he could barely get it in. He just shoveled it in. So I got lucky and I had a pretty good read on that one, fortunately. 
Kevin. So I kind of got – it's kind of like two questions here, but it kind of all links together. So you played uh, on, on both sides of one of the NHL's biggest rivalries. You know, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, always – it's always a crazy match. Uh, so I just kind of want to know what it was like uh, on both sides. And then what was uh, – what was it like in the locker room uh, after Hextall chased Robbie Brown after letting in nine goals <laughs> in that game? What was what was going on with Hextall in the locker room after that game? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. Uh, we'll back up to the first question. Yeah, I got traded from Toronto to Philadelphia back in '89, and uh, at that time, at that time, going to the NHL and, and growing up Canadian, the, the big rivalry for myself was Toronto. Detroit, Toronto, Montreal type of thing. So I was, I was very attuned to that. But I, I didn't realize, and I got to say, it's five years into my career and um, perhaps not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but uh, I didn't realize the uh, the uh, the rivalry between Pittsburgh across state here and, uh, and Philadelphia. And, and you're right, it is one of the better, best ones in the, uh, in the NHL. And uh, there, there's a big love-hate relationship I've noticed. You know, the, you guys – Talk like they hate you and you hate them, and then at the same time, like you'll go down beers together and within reason, obviously. But uh, but uh, it, it is it's quite it's it's quite. I'm, I'm very lucky to have, have uh, witnessed that, been part of on both sides of that because that's that's something I'll always cherish. And I've made Pittsburgh my home, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm very proud of this uh, state, and I'm I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, the Ronnie Hexel thing, yeah, that was uh, that was. Uh, that was quite the game, and uh, you know Mario was was having a great game, and uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of things going on in that game, and and when Mario came down the wall on Hexall, and I now I was standing behind the bench, I didn't like sitting the whole lot, so I stand behind the bench and I it helped the trainer out with getting a stick or water bottle or whatever, watching the game, and then you know Mario came down the left side and. And uh, it, it was just one of those games, no matter what was going on. Like, they, they were playing well. And Merrill passes it over. Robbie Bound taps it in. He's got the windmill going. <laughs> and, and then you see Hexall. Hexy look over. And then he's all arms and legs going off, flying around everywhere. And Robbie Brown, Danny Quinn comes in to hug him. And Robert, Robbie Brown just takes up off the wall. There's Hextall and uh, Turk on the bench. We're, we're laughing. And... Uh, <laughs> Paul Holmgren, the coach, he looks over at, uh, he looks down the bench and he goes, Ray, you're in. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we got to go in the, in the game. And what a lot of people don't know is that game, we, we, we ended up with a, Keith Acton started, uh, like, getting a little chippy. And we had a, a five on three at the last minute and so And I got kicked out of the game and Hexel got thrown back in the game. So it was, it was a heck of a game. It was one of my favorite games, I'll tell you that. So that's a great segue into my question. That 89 playoffs, after game five, Penguins put in 10 goals. You're thrown in for game six and seven, and you win them both, knocking the Penguins out of the playoffs. So what was going through your head that, like, you got to start against Mario Lemieux and the Penguins with a chance to go to the Eastern Conference Finals in two elimination games? Yeah, yeah, that – that was Montreal right after that, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. That that was, I think, game five was when Hexall and the Robbie Brown thing happened. And then Hexall did play game six at home in Philadelphia. And then right before, uh, I guess, morning practice when it went down, game seven is when I found out that uh, Hexy wasn't going to play and that, that I was going to play. Um, and I had no idea as well. He had, a, he had, a, I think it was an interior ligament on his knee. It was a little bit, wasn't torn. It was stretched. It was causing a lot of problems. And he, you know, last couple, you know, week anywhere. So that I'm aware of that probably, you know, he was, I did, he was doing that. But anyway, they threw me uh, in and, uh, and I was nervous as heck with that, with that one. And I, I, I remember, uh, I talked to Mark, Mark, uh, how, and I, I pulled him aside and I said, uh, I said, Howie, I said, I, I said, I, I'm, I'm not Ron Hexel. I can't play the point on power play. I said, I'm going to need you guys to to help out a little bit. And, and uh, so he, we kind of got a game plan with, uh, with Mark. And Mark uh, grabbed the coach, one of the assistant coach, and we grabbed the defenseman, and we sat down, and we just said, you know, basically the same thing. Like, you know, Hexel's not playing, and you got to 
adjust because you play a certain way with a guy with talent like Exxon. I mean, it's, it's almost like those trap always behind the net or uh, hinder a guy like that for doing his job and he has to be punished for it. He was amazing with the puck. I mean, he, he was. And um, so they had to do a little adjustment for me because I, was, I wasn't like him with the puck. And they did. And, and, and the, basically what they said was just stop the first shot. We got the rest. That's what, uh, what they told me. And, so, and if you watch a game, it's pretty much what happened too. Like they cleared away all the rebounds. They just played solid. Uh, and and it, it was and I and to be honest with you, I think the Penguins were a little bit uh, overconfident. That and, I, and how can you be with starting goaltender? A guy, a guy like uh, Hextall goes down, and uh, you know the backup goaltender goes in who hasn't played any amount of game for the Philadelphia Flyers after getting traded from Pittsburgh. I mean that was a perfect storm for Philadelphia not to win. You know. Right. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, so the trade, you and Shell Samuelson and Rick Tockett um, <laughs> head to the defending champions. As soon as you got the news, what are, what were your immediate thoughts? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I was always one of those guys that wasn't I, – I, I felt – I didn't want to leave where I was. I didn't like being traded from from Toronto. I didn't, you know, it, it kinda, it's kind of, it's kind of like you know, all of a sudden you're up and moving, and and that and that that's your initial, at least my initial thought. Uh, but then you, you started looking at it, and I thought, oh, well, you know, they won the cup last year, and you, you know they got this lineup, and you know, Lemieux and all those guys, and talks coming with and Shell. Shell was my roomie, and you know it, it was it was great. It was it was nice, and they really made it. Uh, Welcoming, welcoming in Pittsburgh, and, and again, it was like walking into the dressing room with an all-star team. I mean, it was it was uh, it was intimidating, but uh, yeah, it took a while to, to realize that all of a sudden, like, while well, you're in this greatness, and at the same time you're right, you're right towards the end of the season, and the Stanley Cup or the playoffs are there, and and uh, and they weren't that far; they were probably five points out or five points inside the playoffs when we went there, or something like that. And it, it, it wasn't that you go to a Stanley Cup team and all of a sudden you're supposed to win the Stanley Cup team and look back 30 years later. And you, you got to work. I mean, you, it took everybody. You got to learn to adjust and to fit in. And it took a lot of hard work to, to, to blend in, to earn the respect, to, for people to understand how you play. And again, that's what we talked about earlier. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. And they just point, just things like that. They're excited and they're, there's a lot of work and a lot of effort to, to make them successful. And you yeah, we're willing to put the time in. Paul. Oh. And what do I need to order at 31 Bar and Grill? What do I got to try there? You have to try the bison burger Ooh. with duck fat like fries. And guy gauging by those northern lights back there, I think you'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be in Pittsburgh in about a year. So when I go in there, I'm doing bison burger with – and what kind of fancy hipster sauce is on it? Duck sauce? No, duck fat fries. Oh, duck fat fries. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. The fr fries are cooked in duck fat, and they give that nice little uh, taste of the wild. And the bison burger has some uh, wine uh, wine sautéed onions on top of it, and it, it is to die for. It's really good. Put some hair on your In fact, uh, Shane Ferguson, George Ferguson's son, is our chef here. And he has done great. He's turned, ever since his COVID, we're an entertainment venue. And we turned it around and got the kitchen going. And uh, I'm just outside the kitchen. They're cleaning it up now. And that's a good sign after everything we've all went through in the last yeah. year. And, uh, again, like things like this, we appreciate you having me on. Kevin. Um. So I was looking uh, through all the teams that you played on, and, I mean, you've, you've played in front of or behind some good defensemen. Uh, so I was just curious as what what would be your favorite uh, defensive pairing to have on, on the ice with you at any given moment? What two defensemen you taking? Wow. I, I play with some great, great guys. Uh, Nick Lidstrom. <laughs> yeah. He, he sees us solid. <laughs> And uh, I, I was a big fan of Larry Murphy as well, uh, playing with him, uh, especially in Pittsburgh with his, his uh, up and over uh, dump out and, and uh, you know, those guys we played with. Uh, and, and again, with Shell Samuelson, you know, the guys that I played with, I, 
we got to know each other pretty well and know each other's mannerisms. I think that the chemistry there helps make the team better and, and all that. But, uh, again, when I was in, uh, in Toronto, when I first came in the league, uh, had, had the opportunity to play with Borea Salming. And, uh, that was, that was quite the, the experience. And, you know, he'd, he'd be backing up with the guys that came down the wing and he'd take a couple steps out to get them, step into them if he missed them. He'd swing around and he'd, he'd uh, sweep check by the time he got back to the net around him. It's just some of these guys they had the opportunity to play with and how good these superstars are in the league is, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. It's to, to really have the opportunity to play it alone and to watch them for all of us. And you had Murphy and Lynch come together in Detroit, right? Yeah, yeah, I did as well. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. the first the first time you become an unrestricted free agent in your career, you decided to sign with the Detroit Red Wings. So what what made you decide to go there? Was that the best offer or was it just plainly you wanted to get another cup before you retired? Yeah, I, I, I left. People don't know this, but I'm going to back you up a little bit if I may. Uh, I, I was on no trade contract um, when when the expansion went in with, uh, I believe it was Carolina and Nashville, and I was supposed to go to Nashville. And, uh, and I had an opportunity to get, to get traded to Calgary. My dad was in the Air Force. We grew up a uh, good 10 years in Coal Lake, Alberta, and I played junior in Lethbridge, Alberta, which is – right around Calgary, Alberta. And that, and I knew I was towards the end of my career and I was looking at possibly retiring out there and, uh, and debated that. So that's why I went out there. And then my, I had a back, back issues with the Penguins that year before the expansion, which I got traded. And then, so after Calgary, I missed, when I was in Calgary, I only played half the season. My back was not good. And uh, I had a chance after that. It was a one-year deal. I had a chance after that to go to either Chicago, New York, or Detroit. And uh, I'm not a, much of a big city person, to be honest with you. And that kind of – which is not like Detroit's a small city either. But, but New York New York was definitely a, a no-go. I wasn't, I wasn't fond of the direction the Blackhawks were in at that point. And I was probably wrong because they were probably right, right there in the building for the, what they just went through. And Detroit, I thought, was my best option. And, uh, but but I, I think what happened to me was I, the rivalries, like I said, was Detroit and Chicago back in the Norris Division when I was with Toronto. So I never did get comfortable in Detroit. So in two years, the old second year there, I got sent down to, to Winnipeg. And that's where we ended up with uh, UN and the Blues. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ken, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate that. I uh, want to thank everyone who's been watching on YouTube, iHeartRadio, Facebook, Spotify, wherever you're listening. And thank you for thank tuning you for in. Tuning. And everyone have a wonderful night. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Ken. Nice to meet you, man. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you, man. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah.